you have bars and everything. Hello, so glad to see you this fine day. I hope you're doing well and the Lord's blessing your time that you have. So it's wonderful to see you again and we're going to get right into the message that has, we're going to be looking at Philippians 1, 19 through 26. I had hoped to finish the whole chapter, but uh, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to, to do that today. But let's take a moment to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that you've given us. You've given us breath. You've given us eyes. You've given us ears. You've given us a heart, and you care about our hearts so much. We ask that we could fill it with joy through your presence in our life. We ask that you would remove hindrances that uh, block your Holy Spirit from working through us and in us and seeing the path that you have for us. Lord, we want to lift up those that uh, have lost property. We think of uh, our mayor. We think of uh, many other people that, whose names we don't know, but it must be a horrible thing uh, to lose everything that you have. Uh, worldly wise. So we're thankful that uh, there was no one injured, killed in their home. Uh, we pray for the family of those that uh, did lose a life that I just heard about a PG&E uh, lineman. So we just pray for their family and comfort. And those that know you would minister and take this opportunity to be with those and mourn with those and comfort those that have lost homes and and those that have lost a life. We thank you now that you've given us everything that we need. We may have wants, but you have taken care of us. So we want to give you the praise and the glory. We're thankful for your word, which is available to us at any time. So many of us have so many Bibles in so many places, Lord. May we turn to those that we may rejoice always, that our heart will be filled with the love that only you can give us with the comfort and the security that only you can give us. So we commit this time to you. We give you the praise and the glory for what happens. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right. So as we've been studying Philippians, we've been looking at Paul. Remember, Paul's in jail when he wrote this. And I don't know how many times I read as I go through this about rejoicing, about joy, and how he's talking to a church that he yearns for, that he has great admiration for, that he sees their progress as they move forward and closer to him. He, meant, he makes mention in the, in the first chapter, beginning of it, about whenever he thinks of them, he mentions them in their prayers. May I say that, uh, Elmira Baptist, you will always be in my prayers. Uh, there's no way that uh, I could not pray for those here and for the leadership here and for the time that I've had here. But Paul continues on. He has a great testimony. He wants to be without offense. In verse 10 it says, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's a good testimony and a good prayer. But quite often, through all of this, through trials, through all the things that Paul went through, shipwrecked, being beat, uh, stoned, and imprisoned, he still had one goal, and he wanted to keep his eye on that goal. If you can just turn over a couple pages, and it's in your notes if you happen to have printed them out, but I should have told you, make sure you got your Bible out. We're going to be doing a little bit of turning. So Acts 20, and we're going to read verse 24, one verse, Acts 20. 24. For a certain man named Demas, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Dana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. And I'm reading the wrong verse. <laughs> I was in 23. Here we go. But none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of grace of God. So Paul's had many disappointments. He's had challenges. As he, but he kept his eye on one thing, the finish line. 
And as we grow older, which I know many of us will do, I think it comes naturally. As we grow older, we need to keep our eye on the goal. Paul's going to show us some goals to keep our eye on. Now, these are spiritual goals. And spiritual goals, I found, help me in my uh, worldly goals, if I can use that word, my secular goals, which we should have also, because we need the plan, right? Because you've heard, and I've said many times, and other people said, if you, if you don't plan, you plan to fail. But let me give you a point here. There was hours ago, hours past, when the person had passed the finish line at the Olympic Stadium. Uh, but the time of the drama's day's events, everyone thought was over. But coming through the gates, heading towards the finish line, there were still a few people left. There was a man, and every, caught everybody's attention. He had bloody knees, was coming through the bandages. His clothes, his uh, shirt was ripped and soiled, and it looked like he had smudges on his face. So he was hours behind the, the man that was ahead of him the last one in the race. This caught those people's attention that were still there. They began to look and keep their eyes on this athlete. And he's, he came limping into the arena. This man from Tanzania grimaced with each step. The pain was immense. People just fixed their eyes upon him. And uh, so he finished the race. He crossed the line. Some people just had to ask who were down there and said, why? Did you continue? You were the last one. You were in pain, but yet you kept going. He said, my country didn't send me 7,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 7,000 miles to finish a race. What a testimony of this man from Tanzania. So I would like to say my country has asked us, has asked me to finish the race. My Lord most important, has asked me to finish the race. So we need to keep our guard on. That's why we come to church every time the doors open. That's why we open our Bible and read it, is so we can finish the race as he gives us strength, as he gives us joy, as he gives us direction. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, let's see if I can get this one right. That comes, yeah, there we go. First Corinthians, there we go. 1558. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Labor in vain in the Lord. There is no vain labor in the Lord. No matter what you do for him, it is not in vain. He will use it as he see fit. So we do not want to just give Christianity a try. You know, there's people say, I'm going to try. I'm going to try this Christianity thing. No, that's not what God wants. He wants a commitment from us. He wants us to, to continue. We don't want to be a, a Demas Christian. The Christian life is not a sprint, as we talked about. It's a marathon. It's one foot in front of the other, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult it gets. If we keep our eyes on the Lord, he will give us the strength to continue on. By the way, that uh, Demas, there was a reference, uh, 2 Timothy 4.10, because uh, Demas had forsaken uh, his walk with Paul and the other believers uh, for worldly interest. But that was 2 Timothy 4.10 as a reference. So what we need to do is we need to know what kind of tools we have in our toolbox to have a secure outlook. That's what we need to know. That's what we need to be assured. As everyone references now, the time this summer since March has been a time of trial and testing and what's next. And you know what? As much as I didn't like it and I don't like it. I see positive things coming out of it. I see a security in Christ. I see that I can have an outlook. And I'm thankful for the leaders that kept us going, that did what they could, when they could, how they could, and adjusted uh, to everything that came our way. So how many tools, verse 19, how many tools are in your toolbox? Us guys know that we like to have lots of tools. 
Some of people are just amazing with their tools. They can go to fix your washing machine. And I've seen it. They come into my house and they know just what tools to bring. They have all kinds of tools in their truck. But they grab five, six, seven tools and a package and boom, they're able to do it. So we need to know what tools we have. Reading verse 19, Philippians 1, 19. For I know this is, that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Christ. Jesus Christ, pardon me. So, if you could have two wishes, just two wishes for your Christian life, what would they be? Take a moment. I'm not talking about anything besides your, your Christian life. What would they be? Well, I think Paul here gives some that I want to adapt for my Christian life. Anybody know what they are? You should have some blanks to fill in there. So, I would say Romans 8, 26. Let's see if we can get a little insight in here. What was it that Paul was saying? Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh, maketh intercession for us from groanings which cannot be uttered. So Paul had two things. What were they? Prayer and the Holy Spirit. What powerful weapons. What powerful opportunity that we have. We have prayer meetings here. You have opportunities to pray with your spouse, families, friends. But if it's filled with the Holy Spirit, we can have amazing results. Do you believe that? Do you believe that prayer will, and filled with the Holy Spirit, that you will have amazing results in your life, in the life of those that you're praying for, in our city, in our county, in our state, in our country? Filled with the Holy Spirit and prayer. Imagine buying a brand new car. You just brought this, the perfect car you're thinking of right now. Maybe it's a truck. And you just bought it and you drove it home. You got your garage all cleaned up. Everything's ready for it. You got a little pan underneath. It's a new car. It's not going to drip. But you put it in there just in case. Uh, and you drive it in there. You park it. You dust it off one time. You, you know, you've seen those things you buy. They got like a feather duster and you got all the dust off it from the road trip from the, uh, from the uh, car lot. And you park it in there. Maybe you cover it too. You put it up. Oh, I can't wait. You grab those keys, you go outside and just throw them away. That's not going to do us much good. What good does that do? Do you know we have keys to amazing power through God? Amen. Have I? I had to ask myself, I always do first, have I thrown away those keys? Am I not grabbing hold of the power that God has given me? Have you, are you not using the power that God has given you? I don't know, but I know that it reassures me that I want to be more like Christ. That would be foolish to throw the keys away. It would be foolish for us not to use the, the things that God's given us to use. The Holy Spirit being accessed through prayer. Now remember, I got a, a little reminder here about the Holy Spirit. You have to be right with God, right? If you're getting convicted about something, a thought, a deed, whatever, and you're not obeying God, you're hindering your prayers there. And you know, you can tell when your prayers are hindered. You don't have that key in the ignition. You got it in upside down. You got it wrong. It feels like it doesn't go any higher than this ceiling here. So that's a time to get right with God so you can get back into the driver's seat. All right. Often we don't realize how valuable something is until it's gone. You've been there? How about we just talking about? We're in the middle of something. How much did we value meeting yeah. together? I don't know about you, but I got kind of in the habit Sunday morning. This is what I did Wednesday night. This is what I did. You, you had things arranged so you could make it. You took care of things. And sometimes you just didn't take care of things, but you just had to rush to church. And it was so easy, wasn't it? But then all of a sudden in our life, it got difficult to meet. How much effort did I go to then? How much effort did you go to then to meet? Let me tell you about a grandma. I've told you before about Grandma Halberg. Wonderful lady, knew her at 86 to when she passed, was 99, 100, I don't remember exactly, but she was a prayer 
warrior. She ministered as long as I knew her, knew her and before I knew her with hospitality, having people over. But the main thing I want to focus in is her prayer life. She told me, she told my wife, that she prayed for me and us and our children daily. But she did other people. I wasn't special. She cared about those in her church enough to pray for them, to set a dedicated time to pray for them. And when I was deployed or when I had certain things, I'd tell my wife, I've got this, this project before me and I'm incapable of doing it, but I have to do it. And I need prayer and I need to go to God. Grandma Halbert prayed. And I know I, other people prayed, but I felt the presence of prayer. But do you know what? Grandma Hubbard died one day. It was a very, very sad time just because she was a friend and she treated us so well in so many different ways. But then I noticed something in my life that I could give her more credit than I had was her prayers quit coming. They, she no longer was praying for me and I felt inside an emptiness. It took me a while to figure out what it was. I thought it was just something I was going through. Was God telling me I needed to get right in some way? I didn't know what it was. But then I realized when I had another need and I wanted to call Grandma to tell her to pray, she wasn't there anymore. So as I said, sometimes we don't know what we got until it's gone. So we have two responsibilities two duties verse 20 1 20 for all the promises of god in him are ye and in him amen unto the glory of god by us according to the earnest expect i'm in the wrong one i am sorry i knew that wasn't making sense it's one of those days now i'll read first philippians i was still in uh, in corinthians first uh, Philippians 1 20 according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed but that with all boldness as always so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body whether in life or death it's our responsibility to walk right with God do you know we don't want to be ashamed when we meet the Lord did you know that we can, uh, I'm a, let's see what I wrote down there. You can, we can be ashamed of our life at a, when we uh, are, I'm sorry, we'll get it here. We can be ashamed of what we do when someone else sees it. Our neighbors, a family member, if we're not walking right, if we're not taking care of those things we know to do. Jonathan Edwards, this is the best way to put it. Jonathan Edwards once said, so live so that should you suddenly die, you would not be ashamed. If your life had suddenly ended within the last 24 hours, would I be ashamed? Would you be ashamed to be standing before the Lord right now? Now, I'm not talking about robbing a bank. I don't think there's too many of us going to rob a bank. I'm talking about a thought when we're driving. I'm talking about an irritation with another believer. I'm talking about, of course, there could be an action. It could be, <laughs> I had a friend that uh, he uh, used to ask things like, is there anything that, uh, that irritates you? This is believers that I do and stuff. And everybody was kind of, you know, like, well, no, no. But then one day somebody said, and I just remembered it, you used to, when you get into the parking lot to leave work, that, uh, or even church, I imagine, I remember work though, that you empty your ashtray, and not with cigarettes and stuff, but with gum wrappers and stuff, he just dump it out of his car. And he never realized he did that, because I don't know about you, I have a tendency to want to keep things clean and neat. But you never know the testimony that you have. How would you like to look over and see Pastor Dean throwing the trash out of his car <laughs> In the parking lot, knowing that, well, I'll get somebody to clean up. He wouldn't do that. But that's the type of image that we can put 
to other people. It's little things that we may not know. It may be a habit that we have, but are we ready always? 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. We don't want to be ashamed. You know, he could come right now in the middle of this Sunday school lesson. He could come tomorrow. We don't know what time he's coming. We should always be ready as soon as we know that we have offended the Lord, we have hurt our testimony, and we should go back to the person if we offended somebody. If not, all we have to do is with God. He saw it. He knows it. if it's a thought, if it's a dream, and it's nobody else was injured it was just your testimony we need to get right with god psalm 1196 psalm 196 it should be easy let's not go to corinthians for some reason my bible keeps open to corinthians i was reading it today as part of my reading 1196 then shall i not be ashamed when i have respect unto all thy commandments we never have to worry of being ashamed in christ if we follow all his commandments. Our second responsibility would be to magnify our body, whether in life or whether in death. Now, I know most of us are thinking, how can we magnify Christ in death? That didn't even sound like fun, but we can. We need, wherever we go, we are the advertisement, the billboard, if you will, the Instagram, if you will, for Christ. It doesn't matter if we're in the line for the grocery store It doesn't matter if we're, as I was the other day, standing in line at the DMV. Our thoughts, our actions, all are advertisements for Christ. Our God, our job, um, God does not demand. He doesn't demand that we prove the gospel. What he does ask for us to do is to practice it. There's no question in my mind that Christ was magnified when Paul and Silas Silas, in the Roman prison there. You know, we ask, we say quite often, uh, no one's ever come up to me and asked, what must I do to be saved? We jokingly say that as we get ready to go soul winning, you know. We got the little things we say, but wait a minute. As I read this, I realized that is not right. I'm going to get back to Philippians here before I go reading the wrong thing again. But what happened? This jailer came up to them. They must have been a good advertisement. They, let's read verses 21 through 26. No, no. Sorry about that. We're, I'm going to read John 8, 29 and 30. There we go. Getting the mixed. There we go. Right there. John 8, 29 and 30. And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always those things that please who? Him. As he spake these words, many believed on him. Our lives can make a difference. There's people that want to know how to be saved. There was someone I met just the other day. We pulled into the parking lot, and our eyes just caught each other. I call it a divine appointment. And he started walking towards me, and I thought he had something to say to me. And he thought because I glanced at him that I had something to say to him. And we met outside our cars, and we both began to share the gospel. (laughs) I said, amen. And after that, we just shared some prayers. We prayed just briefly, uh, but we we were able to rejoice and had joy in our heart. No, we didn't have somebody to share the gospel with, but we met another believer that was willing to share it with the other person. So that was an encouraging, encouragement. So, winding down here, there's two. We have, or betwixt, between the two. What does it say as we read in the verse, to abide or depart? Betwixt, depart, or abide. Let's read verses 21 now and 26. For to me to live in Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I want not. For I am in the straight, 
Betwixt two, having desired to part and to be with Christ, which is far better, amen. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you, all of you, further, furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Amazing. Again, this man's in prison. And he's talking about joy and rejoicing. And he's caring for those that are free, that are out there. He's praying for them and he's writing this letter. But you know what? This letter is written to the Philippian church in Philippi. But this, we could take this out now in our mind. We wouldn't do this in real. We could put Elmira Baptist Church right there, writing to you. We could put another church name in there. And that's what's so great about the Word of God. It's living. It's for all of us. And we can apply it even in today. Written so many years ago, there's still applications for today. Now, I know you know, remember Jim Elliott and the Akua Indians in Ecuador? Wow. He didn't have one person come to, come to Christ. He didn't have anything that he could say, I have a fruitful ministry. I've seen it happen. But when Jim Elliott was martyred in his death, the Indians turned to Christ. They saw the Lord magnified through his death. So you think that death can't magnify the Lord? It can. There's many examples. Okay. Okay, either way, through life or death, so long as Christ is magnified, all of us, that we can accomplish more living than we can through death. We have that opportunity. We will die someday, but I need to get busy living today, my life now. That will make a difference. I don't need to see progress. I do not need to see souls saved. I want to see souls saved. I want to see people grow closer to the Lord. Yes, that's why we teach Sunday school. That's why there's preaching. That encourages everyone who's a teacher, little, small, big pastor, is for you to move forward in the Lord. That's what Paul's doing to a good church. Many people, I've known people that come out and they say, I don't like that church. That pastor talked about sitting and he talked about getting right with the Lord. Well, I am right. Well, I tell you, they're not right. If they say that, if you feel that way. And I've been there. I said, you know what? We were just talking about it this morning. I've heard this message a hundred times. I think I'll tune out. But I learned through the years, no, no, no. You pay more attention because you're going to get another nugget out of that scripture, out of that message that will encourage me, that will straighten me out. I know that takes a lot of work that will lead me in a better path, keep me on the right path for the Lord. So, we can rejoice today because Christ lived a, what? A perfect life, a sinless life. And then he was willing to be a substitutionary, a death for us on the cross. God was magnified in both and should be in our lives as well. So Christ is another fine example. Walked around this earth, ministering to people, ministering to religious people that were going the wrong way, and he never sinned. He didn't do a thing wrong. Can you imagine even going through a week dealing with someone that's opposite of you? And if you're either for God or you're against him. I'm sorry, there's no middle road there. And God would rather have you against him than trying to hang out in that middle road because he can work with somebody that will admit to where they're at. But Christ, through his death, gave us eternal life. He took my sins upon him. He took your sins upon him. He who had done no wrong. I love the verse, uh, my Jesus, I love thee. In the hymn, I love the third verse. Because it says, i got to read it here and make sure I get it right. Where is it? There it is. I will love thee in life. I will love thee in death. 
and praise thee as long as thou lendest me breath. And say when the death dew lies cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. If we'll love him in life, the chances are we will love him in death. If we don't love him in life, I don't think there's much chance that suddenly we're going to love him in death. It's our walk. It's a continual walk. Have you got goals? Remember, you guys that go to the gym, remember on New Year's, right after New Year's Day when you go to the gym that you've been going to faithfully? You can't get a piece of equipment. It's so crowded. Everybody there is working out. Good intent. They made a commitment for whatever reason to start going to the gym. Well, quite often by the end of January, sometimes the first couple of weeks in February, you now have plenty of equipment to choose from. It's hard to keep those goals. There's many obstacles that stand in the way of good, attention, good intentions. So the goal for us, as I was talking about earlier, is to be Christ-like. Do you believe you can be Christ-like? You can. Why would it say, why would he, God ask us to be Christ-like if we can't? So in our life, but it's never far to the next step. We make a commitment to be Christ-like. We make a commitment to read the, our Bible daily. We make a commitment to come to church as often as we can. But there's always one step. It's one step at a time. It's planning ahead, making sure things are taken care of. We used to travel to a church because there was only one good church. It was an hour something away, an hour and 15 minutes. We were on church on time more often then than when we moved closer to another church. Why? Because Saturday we got ready. Saturday we put the clothes out. The kids got their clothes out. We had everything ready so we could be to church on time. So, remember, our objectives are not set on what we have done, on what we would like to do, but rather on what we ought to do. Jesus Christ ought to get glory from your life. Start taking a step in that direction today. If you've been making steps in that direction, let me encourage you to ask the Lord, what's the next step in that direction? Someday we'll all meet again. We'll be in heaven. We'll meet in the air. We'll meet there. But we will meet again. So I thank you for your attentiveness and your time being here. And uh, may the Lord bless your day. And may he bless your week, the month, the year that's ahead of you. I'm going to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you've given us this, this time. We're wanting to have goals. We want to have spiritual goals for you. We want to be Christ-like. I ask you that tomorrow, during the message, that you would show us a way. And during our time of reading your word, show us our next step. Let us live a life that's pleasing unto you, that is an advertisement to those around us, that when we die, we can even be an encouragement to others. So we thank you for this time. We give you the praise and the glory for what you have done today, what you're going to do tomorrow, and for the next time that we have. We thank you in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.